Okay, so it's um, it's we are already 26, it's already 1.35, so we can just uh, start. So as I was saying, I repeat, uh, we'll have Felicitas 10 uh, Greek today. Uh, she did her master in, uh, in marine sciences at the University of Hull and um, in the UK. And um, now she's doing her, her, no, sorry, she did her master at the Geomar Institute in Kiel, Germany. And now she's doing her PhD in marine sciences at the University of Hull in the, in the, in the UK. So welcome everyone, I hope you enjoy it. And uh, so the title of, uh, of this seminar today is Microplastics Ingestion in Marine Organisms Looking for the Invisible. So go ahead, uh, uh, Felicitas, and thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for um, presenting me. I will just show my screen now. Yes, I do want this. Can you see it? There yes, yes. Okay, still after a year after the pandemic or with the pandemic, I still don't, I'm not expert in online things. So if anything goes wrong, please no, let me. No, okay, me neither, <laughs> it's okay. From beginning. Yeah, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining to uh, today's seminar. My name is Felicitas. Um, yeah, and I was very fortunate that I could spend, um, despite everything, four weeks here at CCMR to collect some samples for my PhD. Um, yeah, I'm a PhD student at the University of Hull in the United Kingdom, and I'm also part in the plastics in the environment research cluster there. And um, we kind of different people doing very different things um, from social science to chemistry to biology, the plastics, and I'm interested in microplastics and intertidal food webs. So I like to call myself an ecologist. First, uh, a short introduction to microplastics. So um, as the name suggests, um, it's just really small plastics. Um, however small kind of depends on who you ask. So um, generally, um, we say that everything below five millimeter is microplastics. Um, some people say one millimeter, and there is really no cutoff point in the lower end, at least none that everybody uses. Um, so the picture to the right, I actually took that in on the beach in Fargo, and this technically is not microplastic, but is nicely illustrating the problem. Yeah. Plastic, the term actually includes many different polymer types. So types of plastic, uh, we've probably all heard those abbreviations like PE, polyethylene, PS, polystyrene. Um, and all of these are different um, polymers with different uh, properties, but they're all kind of grouped together into this term plastics. Um, although not all plastics are created equal, we call them plastics. Um, and yeah, we do know that they are a bit everywhere they're in the air, they've been found in bottled water, um, obviously in the ocean, they've been found in the Antarctic and um, near shore environments. So they really are everywhere. And they're also in animals. So microplastic, microplastics have been found in marine benthic animals. Um, sorry, I'm screen thing. Many species have been found to contain microplastics, so individual species that people have looked at, they contain plastics. Um, however, the effects of microplastics ingestion, um, they're still not quite clear, um, and they seem to be very species specific and variable. So some species seem to be very sensitive to plastics, um, and they show a gr reduced growth rate, for example, or reduced feeding. Um, with other species almost show no um, response upon the microplastics ingestion. Um, so really, we, do, we still don't really know what the plastic actually does and what, what the problem here is, which I find quite interesting because microplastic as a field is not that new of a research field. And we're still kind of in the beginning, um, although in the last couple of years, it's been picking up a lot. Um, yeah, so my PhD um, deals with microplastics and intertidal food webs. Um, 
and more specifically in benthic communities, so animals that live on the ocean bottom. Um, and I'm especially interested in those benthic communities because they're, they're very close to the source of plastic pollution or pollution in general, um, because most plastics is coming from land, um, either from direct runoff um, by the rain or um, from like wastewater and waste treatment plants. And um, those um, benthic and nearshore environments are also the first sink of microplastic pollution um, because the particles settle and the beaches near our shores. Um, yeah, as I said before, not much is known about microplastics ingestion beyond the individual level. So individual in terms of species are individual. Um, and what interests me is what drives the microplastic ingestion? Um, what are the factors that make one animal ingest more or less plastics? Um, so the main factors that I'm looking at are the habitat, so where the animal live, then the diet, for example, if it's um, strictly a meat eater or if it's omnivores and eats a variety of foods, um, and then also the feeding mode. So a bit how the animal eats, because it's quite easy to understand um, an organism like an oyster who filters the water will eat much differently in terms of volume and size than um, a crab. And obviously there's many more factors and possible interactions, but this is just um, the simplified version of what I'm looking at. Um, and then the second question that I'm interested in is what happens after the ingestion. So especially if there's a trophic transfer between species. Um, so if depending on where in the food chain an organism sits, um, it will accumulate more or less plastics. Um, yeah, and then with the Assemble Plus grant, I was able to come here to Sisima to uh, work on a little project about microplastics ingestion. Um, so I, um, we <laughs> sampled two different spots in Villa Formosa, the Paya de Faro and then Culatra. And um, I chose those two spots because um, the quite different in a way that they're far from each other and so very distinctive, um, but they're also similar in many ways um, because on both islands, um, there's houses, there, there's people there, um, it's really close to human impact. So it's not really a pristine environment, even though we would like a pristine beach, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> and I choose to work on four animal species, um, two bivalves and two crabs or two crustaceans. Um, so the oysters and cockles, and then shore crabs and the uh, fiddler crabs. Um, and it shows those four animals because they're um, quite different in the way they feed. So um, oysters and cockles, obviously they're both filter feeders. So they filter the water and eat what's in the water, including plastics or not. Um, however, the oysters, they live in the water column, whereas the cockles are buried in the sediment, so they do feed from different levels in the water column. And then shore crabs and filler crabs, shore crabs, they have um, very powerful claws, they can open bivalves, like for example, cockles and feed directly on the meat, whereas fiddler crabs, um, they have a very different lifestyle, um, they live in and from the sediment. Um, and our uh, debt rewards. I'm sorry, I have a question. Can you see those like small pictures of the zoom on my video? Somebody tell me that. Oh, I just fixed it. Sorry. <laughs> I was wondering how you um, minimize the pictures. Found it. Cool. So um, I want to talk about my methods. So basically, in, in principle, I followed the classical steps of microplastic analysis. Um, 
first is the sampling. Um, so you have to collect whatever you want to look at. Um, I collected mostly animals and I also collected some sediments to have a background um, level of plastic pollution to, have, to be able to compare. Um, these two pictures are actually from my sampling in the UK. So um, even though it looks really nice and sunny, it was not in Portugal, it was in the north of England. And then the second step is the sample preparation, because in order to look at the plastics, obviously you need to um, take the plastics out of the animals. So I used two molar uh, potassium hydroxide to basically digest the animal and then leave all non-organic particles behind. Um, and then those two pictures, you can see what um, after two hours, what happens to, in this case, an oyster after digestion. Um, after that comes the filtration. So this is just the setup I used here at CCMA. Um, and I used uh, silicon filters with a pore size of five micrometers, so really, really small. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse pointer, but um, you can see the filter on top of the flask, the really small square. Um, and then after that comes the particle identification. So that's I guess the most complicated and most important step. Um, here on the picture on the left, you can see the little filter again. It's one time one centimeters. And then this uh, filter gets read and analyzed. Um, I used FTR, so infrared spectroscopy, and but there's also other methods. Um, and I say here particle identification and not plastic identification, because at that point, I really don't know if whatever's on my filter, if that's plastic or just another, um, another compound or just a grain of sand. Um, so here are the results. Um, to the left, that's just um, what the microscope sees of the filter kind of. Um, so you can see all those little particles on the filter. And you have to know that this is from one milliliter of sample. So I digested the oyster. From that liquid, I filled up one milliliter, and there's that many particles in them. That many particles below five micrometers. Sorry, above five micrometers. Um, and then to the right, you can see what the machine kind of gives you the result. So that's the spectrum that this specific particle has. And uh, here I, I choose to show you a polypropylene particle. So this is indeed plastic. Um, so I was very happy in that moment because I found plastic, but also a bit sad, obviously, because we don't want plastic in our food. Um, so yeah, why is this step very, very important? Um, because as you can see, there's many particles and I choose to show you the plastic particle on here. Um, However, most particles that I find were not plastic. And really by the, by the naked eye or even under the microscope, you cannot make the difference. So this um, spectral analysis is very, very important. Um, yeah, you can see in the top right um, that the particle really looks unsuspicious. It could be, it could be anything. Um, yeah, in, all, in the old times, in the beginning of plastic research, um, they used the hot needle method, which um, is kind of easy and works. Um, you just heat up a needle and then hold the hot needle next to the item, and if it smells, it's plastic, which also works. But obviously, this is much more sensitive and gives you the polymer, not only the plastic, but what type of plastic it is. Yeah, this is um, kind of my results so far. I'm running a sample as we speak. So um, I can't really give you a, a perfect summary of the results of the animals I collected here. But I kind of wanted to end this talk with a little discussion um, about the topic. So um, are we really asking the right questions um, generally in microplastic research? And then I want to um, kind of briefly say something about limitations and the outlook on the future of microplastic research. Um, so the biggest problem really is that the methods are still not unified. So um, there's many, many different methods. And um, sorry, 
and also different um, mattresses, different um, samples, environmental samples need different methods. So this kind of makes sense. However, it makes it very, very difficult to um, compare between studies and um, find a good method, really. And um, the methods I was using here, um, as you can see, the really small filter with the small pore size, um, and I only filtered one milliliter on one um, filter, it kind of shows that this was really made for environmental and organic rich samples. Um, so this method was developed for um, analysis of water, drinking water, tap water. So um, obviously you need to have it very sensitive, but it made it very difficult if you look at something like animals or mud, sand, um, which needs a different method. Um, so that's the biggest problem really I, I've found so far. Um, and people are obviously working on that um, and it's great and really needed. Um, and then the second thing is that um, microplastics, once they enter the environment, um, obviously interact with it in many, many ways. So um, for example, um, animals possibly ingested um, and also excreted, they're buried. Then there's the um, issue of fouling, biofouling, but basically microorganisms live on and in the plastics. It's, it's a completely different world. So the plastic that's out in the, in the environment right now, it's not a virgin polypropylene particle. There's many things living on it. And it is changed, for example, by weathering, by UV light or by um, heat. It can change the structure and the surface. And um, also other chemicals or compounds can absorb to the um, particle itself. And then the plastic doesn't, um, the, the plastic itself um, acts as a vector for other compounds, chemical compounds that then could be um, transported in the animals. So really, there's a lot of interdisciplinary research needed. Um, and um, I'm personally, I'm a biologist, I'm an ecologist, so I look at an animal. Um, but um, there's a lot of chemistry behind it and um, other fields as well. So really, I think we need to take this next step and, and really work more interdisciplinary. And then the last thing I would say is a bit, um, a lot of people are kind of riding the wave of this hot topic of microplastic research. And I'm also doing that in a way. And it is all over the news. Um, but I just want to say that um, microplastic research, is, it's a bit different to microplastics. Um, for example, um, the plastic pollution in terms of straws and plastic bags and masks. Um, those things eventually could break down and become microplastics, but um, it's much harder to quantify. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to end <laughs> with a little um, appeal that um, this research field like, really has a lot of potential and we need to improve the methods and we need to improve the questions we're asking um, so we, we can get better results. Um, and I put new with a question mark because I think it's, it's like 10 years since we're using the same methods. So yeah. Anyways, I, I'm starting to ramble. So I will finish up now um, by saying thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening. Um, thanks for the people here at CCMO for helping me um, with sampling, especially Carmen and Jose Paolo, with sampling and analyzing my samples. And um, I'm very fortunate that I was able to come here despite the pandemic and everything. And um, yeah, maybe next time I can tell you more about my actual results. Um, but yeah, let's have a little discussion first. And if you have any questions, then we can do that now too. So thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Felicitas. It was really great. Um, it's really, you pointed really important things, especially for people who are 
um, who are in this field or, or want to, and for everyone actually, because it's quite an important topic for everyone, because we hear a lot about plastics, but there's one thing that you focus, I, I find it really uh, interesting and important is the polymer types. And regarding that, I, I would like to ask you one question. Uh, you, you talked about, so I don't understand any, nothing about uh, polymer types, I'm sorry, but you talked about the PET, PE, PS, like different polymer types. Is this, uh, the, does the, so can you distinguish between them based on that spect, uh, spectro, spectroscopy analysis? And, um, and yes? Sorry. Yes, you can. <laughs> okay, great. That's cool. great. Um, yeah, you can, and they, they have like different properties. So um, for example, different densities. So some, some plastic polymers, they sink through the bottom, some are in the water column. Okay. So this is where kind of where you are as an organism, it can influence what you ingest. That is very important, okay. And, and uh, do, you, do, you, do you find, or have you found so far, although I know you're, you're at the beginning, uh, any particular one that is quite, quite dominant compared to the other ones, or any particular one that is more difficult to um, to be degradable, although none of them are degradable. But do you understand? Anyone that uh, any mm -hmm. of them is more resistance at one hand, and there is any any one of the types that are more abundant that we yeah. I mean that we could focus on. Okay, no. At least, uh, because you cannot say to people, let's avoid using plastics, I mean, let's stop using plastics, but at least if you could say, okay, at least try to not to use plastics with this or the other component. Is it possible? Um, that's, an, and that's an interesting um, question, actually. So, um, yes, there is some plastics that are more prevalent. Um, the most common ones are actually um, polypropylene, polyethylene, and also PET and PVC, they're just the most used. And I also like, I haven't analyzed, statistically analyzed my data yet, but I, I've seen them the most. Um, so yes, of course, but um, okay. as I said, those are the plastics that are the most used in, in, in daily um, things, like even the gloves we're using, but I guess not the gloves, I don't know what the gloves are made out of, rubber maybe. Anyways, um, like daily, um, plastic household e items um, are made out of these things. Okay. I think one thing that I try to avoid is um, polyester clothing um, because everybody, I think most of us has heard of the fibers that can come out of it. Um, and it just, it doesn't feel nice on your skin anyways. Um, <laughs> so I try to go for natural fibers in clothes, for example. That's one thing that every, everybody can do. Okay. Uh, Carmen, do you want to, to make a question? Yes. Please. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Felicitas, for the talk. It was very natural and clear. And uh, I think it's also important to, to point to the, to the needs of a stand, standardized methods uh, in order to compare studies between regions and uh, research institutions and researchers. Um, my question is about, uh, so your PhD is mostly focused on the microplastic in the intertidal uh, uh, web food, uh, food webs, sorry. So how can you track the microplastic from one level to the another? Say, uh, you have the short crabs that fit uh, among others on cockles, right? Or other clams or clams. So if you find a percentage of, say, this type of polymer in the clams, and uh, then in the shore crabs, you find like uh, the same polymer with a very high uh, concentration, can you somehow relate this like a uh, bioaccumulation of the microplastics? Um, yes, so that's the idea behind it. Um, if you find the same types in higher concentrations, then um, there's a high chance it comes from the food. Um, just because one crab eats many, many um, clams or cockles, for example. Um, I guess in reality, the picture is not always that clear. Um, and there's also many mechanisms of one individual to remove plastics. So they also poop it out, basically. Some, some um, for example, um, some bivalves actually 
um, they clean their gills frequently because they live in the sediment and there's a lot of grains of sand. So they are used to removing particles. So um, the, the way of ingestion is not always that linear in a way. Okay, I see. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, difficult to, to track, right? So the, 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 uh, how they transfer from one level to the other. But uh, yeah. with the polymer identification, you can have some clue, right? If it's something that is repeatedly found in the species and in the prey, uh, possibly you can correlate it, at least correlate it, not related, but at least correlate it, right? Yeah. Yeah, also I'm planning on um, next year maybe doing some feeding experience back in, back in England, feeding experience where I can kind of track where the um, plastics end up, um, okay. where the plastics end up, um, if it's in another animal or if it just get excreted. Um, so yeah, that will be really interesting. Yeah, yeah, looks like I could experiment. <laughs> Thank you very much, that was my question. Thank you. Um, so we yeah, have one, one question. Did you see the, uh, yeah. from the so, Professor Aureliano Alves? Um, good afternoon, Professor. Um, yeah, so he's asking um, in the infrared spectra you showed, did you associate any of the bands to the compounds present in your samples? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Um, I mean, there are, are, also, I mean, yeah, there are two. two two groups of bands in the left side and the, on the right side. It seems it appear, they are different. I don't know. Of course, you make a control first what, um, of the sample you are looking, and then you associate the bands of your samples with the controls. Did you ever already assign that uh, bands to which one is which? Um, this is important, of course. Yeah. So. Um, Basically, I have a, a spectra for, for every particle on the filter in the end. Yeah. Um, and then I also have blank filters where I only filter at my, um, the, the KOH um, and the um, water that I use to um, rinse the filter. Um, and I, I will be able to compare them because I, I know kind of in a way how, how much plastic yeah. comes from the outside was from my sample. Mm -hmm. um, I did find consistently less particles in my, uh, in my controls. Um, I don't remember if I found any plastic actually. There was definitely less. So does that answer your question? I'm not sure actually. You're very quiet. <laughs> okay, so, okay, thank you. Sorry. So does anyone else's uh, question? Um, well, anyway, I would like to just to make you one small question, Felicitas. Yeah. Is, uh, you said that there were some um, some particles that were not plastic that you found in the in the in the that 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 sample. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what they were? I mean, were they sand or were they other? Yes. Um, so that depends a bit on the animal. So, for example, in um, the cockles, they were in the in the um, sand. I found a lot of sand. Um, I also found a lot of proteins. Um, they're just remnants, I guess, from the digestion. Um, and uh, in the fibers, so the fibers are kind of a lot of times in microbes research they're seen separately because they're very different in their shape. Um, and a lot of fibers were cellulose. So. Um, from natural origin. Okay. Um, I don't see anyone that wants to make a qu any question. So I would just like to, to ask you, what do you think about those? You talked about uh, those me the methods. They are not unified at one hand and on the other hand, they are, they are um, you need new methods for complex metrics because of course it's, uh, uh, we started from the basic idea that it's, it's just plastic, but it's not just plastic. And now that we are able to go deeper into understand at the molecular level. Um, so what, what do you, 
what have you seen or what have you research uh, search for or what you think it could be really um, what do you yeah, like well, to use in your phd as a new approach or or as you yeah what, what i kind of wish for in mm -hmm. in methods um well i think for us and for me when i started i read obviously all the papers on, on most of the papers but it was very different difficult for me to really understand what was happening because um every they used different methods or just slightly adjustments so they can fit their sample um, and what we really need is kind of like a workflow i think there's one for fish because it's a it's a um it's an important species for uh, aquaculture and fishing um but we also need uh, the same kind of workflows that everybody can follow um for um muddy samples sandy samples and uh, also um for some crustaceans because their shell is really difficult to get rid of so uh, not a lot of people work with crustaceans and i kind of suppose that's why <laughs> um so yeah I, I wish for for like a clear guideline and then um, I really like the silicon filters um, that I used here, but the only problem I have is a bit with the pore size and the size because I have to take a lot of subsamples of my sample and then I collect a lot of items that I'm not really interested in because um, yeah, five microns is really, really small um, and I will be more interested maybe in things over 50 microns. It's so, very laborious, right? Yeah. Okay. So having another pore size sample that I can filter my sample over would help, for example. That's okay. kind of like a, maybe yeah, we definitely way. need some some improvements on, on that. I don't know if you know, there is a, at least, well, to my knowledge, uh, there is uh, Katie Nicastro and uh, Gerardo Zardi work here in muscles, in microplastics. So mm -hmm. they work with Nadja Veles. So, I don't know if you have met him or I don't know. I think it's always good to have someone to to has work who has work in the field to just not just discuss, see what can be improved or not. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. Besides reading, of course. Okay, so um, does anyone has any questions? So there is a, a Paul George Ferreira who says it is a, a, an important presentation, giving the the great problem with the, that the, the oceans are facing. Um, right now, and yes, I agree. But especially, uh, what I think it, it where it really needs improvement is really what you are looking for. It's just not plastic. It's just different types. What is importance? What is the the the, um, the effect or the injury of those different plastics? And then across the 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 food web. Yes, absolutely. So, does anyone have any more question? Uh, another question. No, I don't think so. I don't see it. So, um, well, Felicitas, I would like to really thank you a lot for your presentation and wish you the best luck in your PhD. And um, well, and hope we we hope to have you here for a longer, long time. <laughs> uh, and and then we are look forward to to see your results because they for sure will be very interesting. Well, okay. you need to invite me again for the next. Yes. Semester. <laughs> okay. Sure. You're in the first year, right? Uh, second year. Second. Okay. Then you still have. Uh, we for sure will be looking for for your your, <laughs> your work. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Felicitas, and thank you everyone for coming to to this seminar. Thank you all. <laughs>